Hey, this is our evening Zoom event from the IABDM. And we are so blessed to have Kelly Blodgett back with us. We asked him for some very specific information and ask him, ye shall receive. So he is going to show us about extractions. And Kelly, I'm just going to tell you to take away. I'm going to mute myself. That sounds great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. What I think I'll do here is set up and um, share my screen so that you all can see what I'm seeing. Uh huh. Take it. You're, you're able to see that okay? Yes, we can see it. Super. There we go. Okay. Hello. Good to see you all here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, thank you for asking me back. Um, what I intend to focus on this evening is, is sharing the protocol that we've developed in our practice um, over the last few years uh, that we utilize for extracting teeth. Uh, by no means is it set in stone. And, um, you know, if I'm honest, it continues to evolve. And I'll share some of the, the technology we've uh, in, uh, included as of late, um, but I put up the ACIMD uh, logo here just to share that the presentation I'm sharing with you today is the presentation that I gave back in January when I was graduating from that uh, college. And uh, I'm just really passionate about helping people heal well from tooth extractions. Uh, it's such a commonly practiced thing. Um, and I guess that I got really into it as a resident up at the VA hospital here in Portland, Oregon. Um, and the process has evolved over time as we've been, um, adopted lasers into the practice and things like that. So anyway, I, I'll get to it. Um, here's the issue. Um, my concern is I have come to appreciate more and more over time the issue of uh, cavitation lesions is that if we would just start off in the first place and provide a, a healthful situation where people can heal well, uh, then they don't, you know, that we wouldn't have to be dealing with cavitations. So interesting, isn't it, that, you know, 15 million root canals uh, are done in the U probably more than that now. Uh, I think that was from 2016, but that's a lot of root canals. That's a lot of infection in jaw bones. Um, more than 10, 000, or 10 million rather uh, wisdom teeth extracted per year, which is a whole, I mean, this is a lot of uh, issues in jawbone to think about helping heal well, right? Uh, and as I've read certain books, uh, such as Beating the Heart Attack Gene by uh, Brad Bale, where he talks about uh, chronic oral infections, periodontal issues, root canal issues that lead to strokes, heart attacks, Alzheimer's, things of that nature, um, as well as Tom Levy's book, uh, Hidden Epidemic, uh, all very clear that some of what we do for patients can lead to chronic infection, which clearly is not helpful to anybody's health. So um, it's really important to me to help people, you know, optimize their healthfulness when we're doing whatever we're doing. So uh, I shared last week when I was talking some of my aha with respect to root canals in particular. These are two uh, different angled slices from my dad's cone beam from about seven years ago where he was having just severe infection with these root canal treated molars. Um, so he ended up developing some non-Hodgkin's lymphoma of his left cervical chain. And that was a huge aha for me um, that not only could these, uh, you know, root canals, which at the time I, I didn't really appreciate just how infectious that could become. Um, but also how important it was to help him heal well so that his lymph system wasn't being taxed uh, continuously. So <clears throat> I shared last week also that, you know, I've become really passionate about sharing this information via social media. Um, 
you know, when I was in dental school in the late 90s, um, and still today, as I understand it, uh, you know, we still have endodontic programs. Um, you know, root canals were just considered as par, par for the course. You know, if a, if a tooth hurts, um, you know, no matter what you've done to it, well, it must be because you need a root canal. Uh, matter of fact, I saw a gentleman just, just yesterday. Uh, I had not seen him in three years. And the last time I saw him, he had three teeth that had relatively small fillings where we had talked about getting his mercury out. And he chose to go to another dentist where it was less expensive and they were on his insurance program. No joke, the poor guy ended up having three root canals because of the amount of tooth they spun off. I mean, just ground his teeth down, put zirconia crowns on and, you know, killed the nerves. And now he's got stomach issues. All, all three of these teeth were on his stomach meridian, coincidentally enough. Um, you know, it's just, it's really important to think about, you know, how, how are we treating people so that we don't create more problems than they had in the first place. But anyway, uh, I'm pretty passionate about sharing this kind of information via Instagram and Facebook. Um, and I recognize that it, a lot of it flies in the face of what we are taught and what the traditional uh, dental establishment is sharing. Um, and that's okay. You know, we back, I, I back up what I'm talking about with science um, and research. So, and I like to share that with every post so that yeah, you know, I'm not just sharing my opinions. Matter of fact, you know, very little of, of what I share is my opinion. It's more about pe people's stories and the science that supports um, why we're doing what we're doing to help them. So anyway, it's been really effective um, having that online presence, especially as we're all shifting into this weird new era of, you know, Zoom meetings and uh, digital consultations and such, you know, it's, it's become very helpful having a presence out there. So um, if anybody wants to talk about Instagram and Facebook stuff, you know, please let me know. It's, uh, I, I enjoy doing it. It's quite a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, so with respect to helping people heal, the, the solution that um, I consider most effective uh, for, from a big pick, like I, I'm looking at this from a uh, 10,000 foot view here, is removing sources of oxidative stress. You know, uh, whether that be bacterial, such as you have, you know, gingival sulcus when we're removing root canal teeth. Uh, certainly because the root is porous and the bacteria that gets soaked into the root over time will also be exposed to the periodontal ligament. We need to remove that and the infected lamina dura and the lacunae within that. Um, and I have found it highly effective, and I'll share some of the science behind this, of using erbium-based lasers, and we have both erbium YAGs and erbium chromium YSGGs in our practice, both to do laser deepithelialization prior to removal of the root, and then applying uh, what is called the PIPs or sweeps they're acronyms that refer to how you're using light energy um, with, I used to use water and now we use ozonated water uh, within the extraction site to kind of perfuse that into the bone as effectively as possible and, and swish out the bacteria that are remaining in there. Uh, and, and I love this, I mean, harness the body's own power to heal, right? I think it was maybe two and a half years ago that I did um, LPRF training. It was either three and a half or two and a half. I can't remember exactly, but it was one of those things where the light went on. Um, you know, I, I certainly have taken out enough teeth and grafted enough extraction sites with other techniques in the past to know that, you know, there's nothing quite like the body's own healing capacity. Um, and this just seemed like an absolute no brainer based on the science I was seeing behind it. And that's certainly what we have um, observed with the patients that we're helping. Uh, the other thing that we do is utilize light energy, uh, both red light and infrared light therapies to help stimulate cellular functioning. And I'll share a couple books later on. Uh, if, you're, if you're interested in the science behind it, 
and then also how to apply that knowledge. Um, these books would be really, really helpful. Um, and, and we'll share that as, as part of the, the how, how we exercise that with patients. So I just want to review, um, you know, get up and close. All of us dental folks, you know, we love close-ups of teeth and all this nerdy stuff. So the highlighted red point here, of course, this, this image really isn't accurate, right? Because the enamel on teeth doesn't really go down to the bone level. But, you know, typically there's that three millimeter area that is exposed um, dentin before you hit the bony attachment. And here we see dentinal tubules and the bacteria that surround them. And this was one of these things that just dawned on me a few years back. It literally woke me up out of the middle of the night. Um, you know, like, wait a minute, R roots are porous and bacteria are, are bathing around those roots when they're dead. How big are those bacteria and how big are the tubules? And I, you know, one o'clock or so in the morning, I started researching this stuff and found these images that show, yeah, golly, it's not too challenging to uh, imagine these bacteria making their way over time inside the roots and you know if, if any of you have seen my instagram post i share almost weekly uh the blackness that we see inside those roots when they become when they get extracted and you know we find that's the dark pigmented anaerobes that have infiltrated the roots so we want to be cognizant of that and of course once we remove the blood supply nerve supply and the lymphatic drainage we have no defense against that infiltration so here, you know, my cute little arrows showing, you know, bacteria making their way in and then making their way back out. Again, it, it behaves a lot like a sponge. And those of us that take out teeth for a living, we're familiar with seeing that hyperemic um, and, and frequently affected uh, tip of the root area um, with along the bone as you're taking these roots out. It's generally not a very happy environment. And here we have, you know, my, my uh, <laughs> gross PowerPoint skills of drawing inflammation uh, within the periodontal ligament space. And here we have clinically, or, you know, the photographic images of a multitude of roots of just blackness. And, you know, I must have pulled out, I don't know, you know, a thousand or a couple thousand teeth before it dawned on me what I was seeing. I think I must have just been taking roots out and throwing them away and not thinking about it for many years. Um, but it finally dawned on me a few years ago that, you know, wait a minute now, this, this isn't right. <laughs> you know, when you finish a root canal, there's not blackness inside. So started, that's when I started digging deeper. And here's just some examples of the levels of infection that we're finding um, with some of these root canal treated teeth. So here's the protocol for the optimization or optimal, optimizing healing of your alveolar process. So with our patients, and we'll go through like who does this as well, because I think part of making any protocol effective is making it efficient. Uh, my team members love to do as much as they possibly can. So typically this will be either one of my assistants uh, or one of my hygienists. We have um, three hygienists on our team who are all licensed phlebotomists. So sometimes they'll start the process with the patient and do the blood draw. So when the patient's coming in, you know, and they bring them back to uh, the operatory, they'll start by doing a, a pretreatment ozone water rinse, you know, as many times as, you know, practical, uh, just to help clean the mouth out. And then the hygienist performs a blood draw. And when time allows, which we try to make this happen as many times as possible, doesn't always happen, but usually, uh, our hygienist will do the ant local anesthesia for us. And there's, there's a very specific reason why I prefer that. Um, part of my background is uh, I've, I've studied psychology and, and my bachelor's degree was in psychology uh, at the University of Oregon. And I've always appreciated kind of the energetic exchange between patients and, you know, either the hygienist or me or whomever is treating them, you know, I, I've always felt like I can feel their, their energy. And I, I know that that is real. Um, and for a lot of people, not all, but for a lot of people, that experience of having the local anesthesia provided is a highly stressful time. Um, so 
if I don't have to be a part of that, it's not costing me that energy that I really need to focus on the clinical aspects of removing teeth safely and effectively. Um, and I have found that, you know, if I'm able to have the hygienist do that local anesthesia, I'm, I'm so, I have so much more energy at the end of the day. So it's part of our process <clears throat> whenever we can do that. Sometimes the scheduling doesn't allow it and I have to do it, but um, usually I will have them do that. So, um, so the way that, and you'll see this because I have videos of everything we're gonna talk about today. Um, I choose to then remove the coronal portion of the tooth. So basically I flatten it off at the gum line. And then I utilize one of the erbium based lasers. So it doesn't matter if you have a light walker or a water laser or whatever, you know, erbium based laser you like. Um, and technically if you had an erbium YAG or a diode, you could do this part. Um, also, it's just not as effective and, and I can share why in a minute. So, but late, you know, use a laser <clears throat> to deepithelialize. Uh, if I have a multi-rooted tooth, I'm going to section it every time. I don't, I don't mess around with trying to pull out multi-rooted teeth without sectioning them. And, and I will share this and I've got a video to share as well. Part of the, um, the root removal process that we have just added. And I'll be totally honest, when I first heard about it, I thought like, this sounds crazy. Um, it's, a, it's an instrument, some of you may have heard of it called the magnetic mallet. And I mean, just the name alone, I was like, that does not sound like a pro uh, or a patient friendly term. I don't think I'll use that term uh, in front of patients. But um, I was at a meeting end of January where a good friend of mine was talking about how he was using it and he just swore by it. And I watched his videos of what he was doing and I thought, gosh, if it's that effective for him, you know, we got to try this. And so we've been using it now for about three, two, two months, three months, something like that. And I'll tell you, we have it out now every time we're taking teeth out. It is so effective. And I'll, I have a video to share with you so you can see that. Um, and then once the roots are out, you know, removing the gunk that's in there, you know, PDL, the, the apical tissues, um, you know, there's usually some garbage behind and, you know, use whatever works for you. If a number eight round burr is what you love or a pizza with a diamond tip, or you know, hand cure it, or maybe you use all of them. You know, it doesn't doesn't matter to me. Um, I tend to use a, a mixture of things as we go, and then I'll pull out the laser with. I tend to use the water laser just because that's what I'm familiar with. My partner uh, is more familiar with the um, the light walker, so we we use different tips for that. I tend to use a radial firing tip to do this pips or and or sweeps um, irrigation where my hygienist with a monojex syringe will slowly put ozonated water into the extraction site while I laser activate it. And we'll do that over and over and over. Um, and we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some science that supports why we do that, uh, but it's beautiful. You know, it helps, you, it becomes so clean in there when you're ready to put the LPRF in. And then there you go, fill it in with your LPRF. Um, when I got trained, you know, I was taught to like, compress it in there as firmly as you can. Um, I find, you know, with our, we use nine, I think it's nine milliliter um, tubes. It takes me about eight LPRF you on average, um, LPRF membranes to fill a molar, the average size molar. So typically I will have the um, hygienist draw more than I'm gonna need. I'd much rather have more than less, right? So that's great. And then, we apply, I, I'm still familiar with the term low level laser therapy. That's what the LLLT stands for. But the term these days is photobiomodulation. We have um, three different 940 nanometer diodes with biostimulation hand pieces that we generally keep in the hygiene room. So towards the end of this, the assistant will go grab the laser. Um, we'll do 3000 joules on each side. So it takes about five minutes and, and I'm creating a di divergent beam that will go when they're coming from the side, it'll go from the chin to the ear. So it's covering this whole face side and then we you know, shift over to the other side. 
Um, and I see some people are throwing up questions. I'm so bad at this. I don't know how to look at questions and, and look at my PowerPoint at the same time. So we can come back to that. Uh, so we do that. And then we also send home what's called a med light unit. It's a th uh, 630 nanometer red light system um, that just plugs into the wall. And when you press start, it turns on for uh, four minutes. And we have the patient do that eight minutes for each area that we've treated for two to three weeks. Basically, we just loan it to them. Um, and then they use, or, you know, bring it back at their post-surgical visit so we can you know, assess the healing. And, and I'll also talk about a couple other tweaks that we added in there. No, I don't want to get to that video quite yet. Um, that we tried to minimize the use of traditional non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So part of what I came to appreciate through the couple of years that I was studying at the ACIMD is that, you know, so many uh, traditional Western, if you want to call that, uh, medications are designed to block normal enzymatic processes. Well, those processes are there for a reason. So when we're blocking them, for instance, if we block the inflammation, it's absolutely true that we're, generally we will experience less pain. We will also generally delay healing. So I'll share towards the end of the what we're our talk tonight um, a few things that we've implemented that have made a huge difference for most patients. Um, we also, we, we give information to the patients so that they can uh, understand that they have choices, right? They can certainly try the process of health optimization. And if that doesn't work for them and they're having too much discomfort and they wanna go the route of traditional medication, absolutely fine, right? We, whatever is gonna work for them, uh, we just wanna give them options and good information. So, so I'll share some videos with you. Um, last week I shared Colin's story and he was kind enough to have all of his procedure videotaped. So this is just, in, you know, some video showing Kristen, who was our first hygienist, um, to go out and become a licensed phlebotomist. She brings Colin back. She has him do the ozone water rinse. And, you know, we were being kind there and sorry, my phone's ringing. Um, we were being kind there and not showing somebody actually, you know, jabbing him in the arm for those who don't love needles. Um, but anyway, so she'll start that process. Pardon me, I'm just gonna turn that off. There we go, real life here. I guess I have one in the background, okay. So, then I will have her also do the anesthesia. And, Thankfully in Oregon, you know, I, I realized that, I think, I think in Texas that, that hygienists can't, and I know there's some other states where hygienists are not licensed to provide local anesthesia, which I think is a real shame. Um, our, our hygienists are a godsend at this stuff. They're so good and passionate about it. And it's so important to them to have patients be super numb. Here you see Colin tapping his nose and, you know, we were, we were taking out three and 13 for him that day. So he, had the joy of being anesthetized on both sides. Um, but they are super passionate about this. Um, I think it's true from a psycho-emotional standpoint that, you know, if you do anything a few thousand times, it's, it's easy to kind of lose the passion for it. Um, and our hygienists don't, they just don't have the opportunity to do anesthesia as frequently as we do uh, as the dentist. So, uh, they love the opportunity to be able to come over and do that and, and help the patients. So then what happens is they'll let me know, um, you know, the patient's anesthetized. Mm -hmm. Come on, video. We'll see if this works for us. So they'll let me know. The patient's completely numb. The, the blood's spinning. I'll go ahead and process, um, you know, and then I'll hop in and start my extraction process. Um, generally speaking, by the time I have the tooth out, they're, you know, they've got the LPRF all ready for me and I, I don't even have to think about it. Um, as odd as it is, or may seem, like I don't, I just do not love extract or uh, doing blood draws. Um, it's not my thing, you know? 
we're talking really about you know running some of this technology stuff here it's not some of our thing and um you know it's uh blood draws just isn't my thing so thank goodness uh, our hygienists are able to do the blood draws for us which is super handy um so i want to share a little bit of of uh science here that um going back almost two decades here you can find science uh, that supports the, both in the, the camps of erbium YAGs and erbium chromium YSGGs, which happens to be, you know, very similar, just proprietary to BioLase. Uh, going back 20 years, we can find studies that look at the effectiveness of using uh, erbium laser technology around roots and on fibrous connective tissue. Um, and I'm just showing you here, I highlighted at the bottom, you know, erbium YAGS laser may represent a suitable alternative for non-surgical periodontal therapy. Well, if you can use it for non-surgical periodontal therapy effectively, you could probably use it for surgical therapy as well. And I'll show you what that looks like. Um, same sort of thing here, right? I'll just get to it. Um, erbium chromium, similar uh, idea here. In this case, they're talking about using the radial firing tip um, in the case of doing root canals. So think of like being in a semi-enclosed space, using pulsed light energy with your rinsing medicament, whatever you happen to be using. Um, if you're doing a root canal, I sure as heck wouldn't suggest using a bleach derivative. Uh, if you're using a laser for the sake that you might pulse it out the end, which isn't good. Um, interesting here that, that, you know, even JADA was on board back in 2007, right? Um, I thought this was really interesting. A dentist in South Dakota did a study where he looked at um, extraction sites, testing them for bacterial load prior to using the laser in a, uh, using the, uh, the PIPS mode with a radial firing tip and after and found a significant reduction in bacteria, which is awesome, right? And this is just something that I think a lot of us who have been laser users for the last 15, 20 years, you start realizing like, oh, there's a lot of creative ways I can use light to be more effective and less invasive for the patients. So here's some image. Um, this was, <laughs> it dawned on me one day like, well, why don't I just test this stuff? You know, we used to use the Hein system. Um, today we use oral DNA um, for here. No, uh, go ahead and hop down, puppy. So, um, what I did was used five sterile endo points to absorb uh, the fluid, the subgingival fluid around this premolar. It happens to be tooth number 13. And so we cut the crown off, we absorbed the fluid in there. Then I used the laser, which you can see here, kind of the approximation of the, the tip. That middle picture shows the trough that's created after using the laser. And you're de-epithelializing and you're exposing healthy fibrous connective tissue you know, beneath it. Then I used five different tips and uh, gathered fluid from in there. And you see, this is what we found, no pathogenic bacteria detected. So just what in theory made sense, I wanted to test it out and just see if theory made any sense. And it follows up with the science that we did find that in fact you can remove pathogenic bacteria using an erbium laser. So we do this every time we take teeth out. I just want to, I want to expose healthy fibrous connective tissue so that my LPRF has something to grab onto very easily and effectively. So here we are in terms of just showing a video. I go in, I use either, um, this is like a diamond, kind of a 557 sized burr or use a surgical length 557, whatever works best. And I just come underneath the crown or the filling or the whatever. Um, if they happen to have, uh, if it's a root canal tooth that has a large mercury buildup, then we're gonna use the SMART protocol um, to remove the mercury first. Generally, that makes it a little bit more of a pain and takes longer, but you know we gotta do what we gotta do to make patients safe. So we remove the top and then go in there with the laser. Um, I find that, um, this handpiece, again, I've been using it since 2004, so I'm just, I'm just accustomed to it. But I will say the, um, the Lightwalker laser 
in terms of its efficiency is just amazing. Um, it, you know, it's a, uh, just a greater energy transmission because of how it's designed, but they both work beautifully. Um, I'll, I'll use which, whichever one's available. So you notice, I mean, I'm just, I'm envisioning that light traveling down along, along the long axis of the root down to the osseous crest. So I'll, I'll do that all the way around the tooth or teeth, depending on what we're taking out that day. So then we go about, and this, this is where like, at this point, I might grab my 301, kind of like I'm showing here, the 301 elevator. Um, so yesterday I was taking these teeth out for the gentleman who had had his root canals done, uh, you know, after crown's gone bad. And, you know, I, I like to use the 301 to get a feel for how loose are the roots themselves, right? And then I will switch over to the, um, the uh, magnetic mallet I call it the osseo touch. That's kind of their, their marketing term, the osseo touch. It sounds so nice, right? Not, not so spooky like a magnetic mallet. So anyway, we get the teeth out. In this case, that thing has had all sorts of apical pathology, delicious stuff. Um, here, I'll share this video with you for those of you that haven't seen the magnetic mallet. There's a little audio too. The magnetic mallet is an innovative device created specifically for oral and implant surgery. It is used for multiple applications in dentistry and is extremely efficient as well as exceptionally safe. Let's see how it works for extractions. The extraction kit contains 10 instruments that have been designed to treat all types of extractions, including third molars. These instruments do not wear out and therefore do not have to be replaced. In this surgical video and rendering, we show you how an ankylosed root is extracted in a short period of time with outstanding results. The 5000 G G-force of acceleration provided by the handpiece allows for straightforward insertion and an almost imperceptible impact for the patient, making the procedure a comfortable and quick experience. In addition, the speed ensures that it does not generate any heat on the bone. The shape of the blade has been developed to easily slide between the root and the bone, which perfectly conserves the tissues while detaching the root. The handpiece is easy to direct at the necessary angulation, ensuring that the buckle plate remains untouched and the root is not exposed to the risk of fracture. Soft tissues and bone are saved while the perfectly preserved root is effortlessly extracted. Technology for minimally invasive surgery has moved forward all right, you get the idea there. Um, yeah, it, it's one, it, I don't know, I get a kick out of how like, I try to be pretty open minded. But when I heard magnetic mallet, I don't know why I was like, God, that sounds crazy. But <clears throat> it is so efficient. I can't imagine doing extractions without it now. So I had to had to share that. Um, and, and frankly, it's not that expensive. I, I don't remember, might have been a, a few thousand dollars. Uh, compared to a laser, you know, significantly less of an investment. So, uh, yeah, I would advise if you like doing extractions, check it out. It's definitely worth it. Uh, so then we go about, you know, cleaning out the socket. Um, in this case, I didn't have any great imagery of Colin. So we, we shot a little imagery here of just curating it out, um, you know, on a different patient using my iPhone. Why not? So, again, use what you like. Use a hand curette. Use a round burr, you know, slow speed, a lot of lavage. Um, use diamond tip, piezo, whatever you like, right? Just make sure it's clean. Make sure the lamina dura and the PDL are out so the patient can heal well. So this is probably my favorite part of the whole thing because it is entirely passive. Um, and I just understand and appreciate the biochemical power of pulsed erbium laser light and ozone. So here we have my assistant bringing the monoject syringe in there. This is of course in slow motion. And then I, as soon as I see this, the water start to flow, she'll say, you know, starting, and then I'll start firing the laser. And then she's keeping an eye on the, on the ozonated water and she'll tell me, you know, finished. And then I stop. And we just do that a number of times. So we're doing T3 and 13 here for Colin. Uh, and you can actually see like some of that 
ozonated water is splashing up on the handpiece. I mean, it's those pops, and I'm only using, like let's say I'm using four watts of energy, four and a half watts of energy to do the de epithelialization. When I'm doing this, I'm only have it at about a half a watt to one watt, depending on what I'm seeing with the clinical situation. And I always start lower, right? <clears throat> you can always turn the energy up if you need it, but it's shocking how when you're in that confined space, how little energy you need to be able to uh, drive that photoacoustic effect in like through the liquid and into that bony uh, cavity. So I, I love doing that. And you notice uh, toward the end here, like the bone is pretty clean and you do get, when you have the, um, when you're using ozonated water or ozone in general, you have the effect of um, the oxidation occurring with that blood that's coming out. So what I found is that if I'm, this is just, you know, words to the wise, if I'm irrigating with ozonated water and I'm not using a pulsed laser, my blood flow will decrease more significantly. But when I'm driving the energy into the situation, I tend to maintain the blood flow because of that photoacoustic effect. So um, just, you know, nerd information for those who care. So uh, <clears throat> now to the LPRF, I found this study. Uh, this was published just about a month before I presented this at the ACIMD. So this group compared um, the, the bony healing of sockets grafted with, with LPRF versus those that did not. And I find it really interesting that uh, the group that were LPRF grafted had less than, on average, less than a millimeter of bone resorption, whereas those that were just, you know, allowed the, the area to clot normally without any other grafting uh, was two, two and a quarter millimeters on average. And that's significant. I love their, their comment that these findings indicate that the administration of LPRF should always be considered when socket preservation is planned. And I would, you know, that, that would be my, my recommendation to any dentist that's taking teeth out. If you do nothing else, of course, besides making sure that the area is clean, start doing LPRF. Um, you know, the patient brings the stinking graft material with them and it has their body's own intelligence and energy. Um, it's so effective at healing. I mean, we just, um, I know Teresa and I were, have talked about this before. I mean, you don't see uh, dry sockets. It's amazing. So love that. So uh, again, here we have, you know, the assistant goes through the process of sitting, setting all this up for me. And um, I tend to do flats. I know that, you know, some of these things, you can make them round. Um, I think I started doing, you know, using rounds when I was first doing this, but I found I just prefer to put in the flats and compress them. Um, sometimes we cut them up into little pieces if I need to get them up into apical regions that are challenging. Um, love that stuff. I think that, and this is so geeky, but if I could do nothing else in practice except take out, you know, dead teeth uh, and do cavitations, I mean, that would be my, my ideal situation. I just love removing infected stuff and helping people heal. Uh, in terms of suturing, you know, we all have our own experiences. Um, I tend to prefer some version of a figure eight suture where when I'm driving the needle through the tissue, I'm actually also grabbing a hold of uh, the, the peripheral edge of that top LPRF sheet to help hold it into place. And of course, then you, we have patients on the soft foods diet and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, generally speaking, if they can stay away from that area uh, for a couple of weeks, that, that'll be great. In Colin's case here, he's having, you know, one tooth taken out on each side. So uh, he's going to end up chewing his eggs and stuff some way. So uh, then we're going to talk about the light therapy that we provide. Um, I picked up laser therapy by Jan Tuner and Lars Hode back in 2002. And I read it cover to cover. I, this was actually part of my due diligence process before I purchased my first two lasers. 
I wanted to understand all the different ways that I could use it. Um, and it's an awesome read. I mean, they, their studies go back to the early 1960s where they were using those, even the early Ruby lasers um, for low level laser therapy benefits. And if you prefer a more succinct read that is not as science heavy, uh, although it, there's a lot of science in it, Ari Witten's book, Red Light Therapy, is a beautiful book. Um, we actually have a few copies at the office. You know, we actually have a library where we just loan books out to people. Um, but that's a great text. He does a wonderful job of talking about the effectiveness of light therapy. So pick it up. Highly advise that you do it. There are so many studies, it's incredible. Um, so as we are wrapping up, we have uh, our assistant, generally speaking, she's the one that will do this, um, do, as I mentioned, 3,000 joules. There's nothing necessarily magic about 3,000 joules, like would it work to use 2,000, 4,000? Sure, you know, it's just, it generally takes five minutes per side, and it's a nice opportunity to have a con like a wrap-up conversation with the patient. Every single patient for whom we do this comments like, oh my gosh, that feels amazing. That's their body's energy giving us information, right? We know this is a good thing. I mean, you could put all the science aside and know like we're doing something beneficial. So you have both the 630 nanometer aiming beam light that is they're being exposed to, as well as in this case, a 940 nanometer diode. You could use an 810 nanometer diode. You could use a 1064 NDAG. You could use any of these near infrared lasers um, to help initiate at a cellular level uh, the stimulation that these wavelengths provide. And then as I mentioned, here's my younger daughter being a, a, a light model for us. That's the, um, that's the actual size of the med light unit so she's kind of mimicking putting it over an area of a lower left tooth extraction. And it's the easiest thing in the world to use. You know, you press start, it turns itself off in four minutes. We tell them to do that twice over every area that we've treated. Um, and of course, we follow up the, um, the visit with an email that has the instructions there. Or they can take them printed if they prefer them printed. Not that many people prefer them printed anymore, interestingly enough. So some of the other things that we will do, um, if the patient says they are open to doing this, I will take their roots and put them on the input side of a remedy maker, which, and don't ask me how this thing works. I mean, again, I'm not an electronic uh, whiz. <clears throat> I'm good at taking teeth out, but I appreciate that it works. So I'll take their, their teeth. This measures the electromagnetic signature of whatever is there. And you can either copy it, which you wouldn't want to do for somebody for whom you've just taken gross teeth out. So you wanna invert it and put that into some sort of remedy. In this case, we like to use Lymphonest. It's a nice lymphatic drainage remedy from Marco Pharma. Um, and we shake it, you know, kind of bat it on my hand before I put it on the output side. And I just press make and it takes 30 seconds to do what it does. And then we give it to the patient and instruct them on how to use it. We also um, will generally give them some Arnica Montana and some Ruta Craviolans. Um, from what I have found, the Arnica tends to be very effective at helping minimize pain and swelling and the Ruta Graviolans is effective for bone injury. Um, so we, you know, if people say that they're open to taking them, we have them there. We just give them away to them. I think they cost, the cost on them maybe is $4 uh, per sleeve. So, you know, some of these things we just do as a nicety because it's a benefit to the patient. And we charge a lot for what we're doing. I mean, our extractions aren't five minute extractions. This process takes, you know, an hour, hour and a half. Um, so, we're, we're absolutely happy to throw all the, in all the bells and whistles. So to summarize, uh, we start with the ozone rinse. We have the hygienist do the blood draw and the anesthesia. Usually that works out well. I then like to remove the crown. If there's a crown on it and the coronal portion of the tooth, just kind of tabletop it right along the gum line. Use my erbium to go around to trough and remove that 
inflame circular epithelium and expose healthy fibrous connective tissue. Um, then I section it if it's a multiple rooted tooth. Uh, these days I would pull out my magnetic mallet or osseo touch and help get that root moving, um, remove the root and all the stuff that's inside, thin out that lamina dura, and then use the laser, uh, erbium laser with the uh, radial firing tip and the ozonated water, fill it with the LPRF and suture it down tight, so to speak. Um, do our low level laser therapy and send them home with the med light. We also, I mean, I will be honest, we also send them home with a few little packets to go packets of uh, ibuprofen because for some people that's their comfort zone. And I want them to be able to have it if, you know, if it takes them a day to get to the pharmacy to get more of that, if that's the route they want to take, they don't have any at home. Most people do, of course, but they don't. That way we're helping them out, you know, along that way as well. Um, we send it to go. All this stuff is, you know, sent home with them in this cute reusable Blodgett dental care bag. Um, you know, it's just a good marketing tool, but it's also a convenient way when you're giving them all this stuff to take home for them to just put it in one bag and, you know, they don't have to tote it around in their arms and such. Uh, especially the men, you know, most men don't come in with a purse, so it just makes it a little bit easier and we dispense the homeopathics. So that kind of covers it. Um, this is my family. This is our, our family picture from last fall. Love them dearly. Um, so I'm open to, uh, you know, opening this up for questions. If we have any questions that were brought up. Kelly, yes. the, the handheld laser that you use, is that like a Q laser? Uh, the one that, the, that we had the assistant using? Yeah, that was, um, what's it called? It's a no, your daughter, the one that your daughter was using. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's an LED unit. It's called, uh, it's a med light, M E D okay. light 630. That, that's the name of it. Um, and did I hear you say that you loan those out to the patient? Yes. What we found is that, uh, like if you were to buy one on Amazon, they're, I think they retail for about $400 a piece. Um, we, we found a way to get them, especially if we buy in bulk, like let's say we buy 25 of them, um, which now we do. So they get down to like 125 a unit, something like that. So we'll buy a bunch. We number them all. And my assistants have developed a tracking system. So each one has a number on it. Um, we, we use Eagle soft. That's our, our software. Uh, but you could probably do this in any, any software. Um, we use our lab tracker, uh, aspect of the software to track down which number they have. And that way, if they forget to bring it back, um, we know which number it is. We'll have somebody at the front desk, follow up with them and make sure we get it back. Or if they decide to keep it, we just charge them the, what, what our cost is. And we have some people who come back, they'll buy three or four of them. Um, they just, you know, they find that they really like how they work. So, yeah. Other questions? I'm trying to unmute myself. Because yeah. um, I've got a bird in the background, so I'm trying to make sure that he stays pretty quiet. So well, after you section the tooth, um, I did hear you say what you're using around there. I'm more familiar with rocking the tooth slightly and letting that, that area where the periodontal ligament is kind of fill in with blood and soak for just a minute. Do you have a, a waiting time in between when you manipulate the tooth and when you actually try to remove it? You know, I, w I would say I used to. So <clears throat> previously, I mean, I did this for years. I would use a little periotome to go down there and, and release as much of that periodontal ligament as I could and give it a couple of minutes, you know, maybe kind of start wiggling them around. This is where um, the magnetic mallet has come in so handy. And I will share this with you if you, if you consider looking into one. Um, the, the patient experience when you're using 
the magnetic mallet to extract teeth is very different than if you're trying to use it for a sinus lift or a ridge split or a widening of a ridge or something like that. Um, it, it's, it is truly almost passive and I rarely need to turn it up beyond the first level. Like it's so efficient that one, as soon as I have the roots um, separated, again, I'll use my 301 just to ensure that all the roots are separate from one another. But then I just grab that magnetic mallet and just tap, tap, tap. And I mean, in an instant, they, it literally drives like a wedge between the bone and the root. And they, they come out now so quickly. Um, it, it, I'm super impressed with it. it. It has really changed and created, uh, you know, changed our, our technique, I guess, in, in the sense that it's just way more um, efficient and we're spending a lot less time struggling getting roots out now. So that's been a huge benefit. I hate to be the only one asking questions, but seeing as I have questions and you guys are not asking anything, <laughs> how do you know, or what is your guideline for knowing in your heart that you have all the periodontal ligament out, all the diseased bone, you don't need to go through uh, maybe a sinus that's diseased, um, are you using muscle testing, just a gut feeling, EAV? Can you elaborate? Yeah, so I would say that the next on our list is um, getting some training in EAV stuff. I think that I'm really excited about it. Uh, we were actually supposed to be going this coming weekend uh, to St. Louis, Missouri to go train with a gentleman there. Unfortunately, we have to put that off uh, with the COVID stuff. But I was supposed to be there training you this weekend. Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah. Really? At Dr. Um, at Dr. Hughes, yeah. No way. Yeah. Uh, well, sorry. so that we would have been there um, next time. We hope to make the one in August. Um, but, you know, I use a lot of my, my visuals. So, like, I, want, I need to see lacunae that have a gentle flow right? Like, like any healthy tissue would, if it's profusely bleeding, we've, we've still got problems. Um, and of course, a lot of it depends on where are we too. I mean, this gentle, I'm just thinking of this gentleman yesterday, uh, you know, unfortunately, in part of his root canal therapy for tooth number two, they stuck a gutta percha cone six millimeters into his sinus. And so, you know, as part of that process of getting his root out, um, we were able to retrieve that, but that's dicey stuff, right? I mean, that, that's, uh, oftentimes that bone is, you know, maybe a quarter of a millimeter thick. It's almost like a thin veneer or something. Uh, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go plucking away at that if I don't need to. Uh, so that's where I'm relying on what I understand about the effectiveness of pulse light therapy. Uh, and I also believe very strongly in the healing capacity of the body. Um, I mean, I, I do think that muscle testing and certainly the EAV, because I, that just resonates for me better. Um, I think those are awesome techniques and I look forward to, you know, incorporating that more into our practice. And so do you automatically send a patient out the door with a prescription for antibiotics? Is there an automatic uh, prescription for pain or do you use steroids? Mm, uh, no, no, no. So it's pretty rare that I will send um, them with a prescription for antibiotics. I almost never write prescriptions for um, uh, narcotics. But if, I mean, it is discussed as an option. And if the patient says, oh, you know, that does help me and they would like that, absolutely. Um, and I don't prescribe steroids. Once in a blue moon, if we're doing a big surgery uh, under IV sedation and it's convenient for the, or for the anesthesiologist to, uh, to utilize it, if it's a big surgery to help their body like get over that hump, maybe. But again, it kind of depends on their whole health spectrum. Um, 
I mean, we see people from the only thing, the only people we don't see are children. <laughs> I mean, that's just, you know, like I said, I went, I went to the VA hospital straight out of dental school. So I got used to treating adults. Uh, but we see people, you know, in their early twenties, all the way up into their nineties. So depending on their health resiliency, um, uh, and their reserves, you know, it, 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 the, how we treat that depends, but I have to say, I mean, we, we write very few prescriptions. Um, I will also say I do, I prefer to send roots out to DNA connections. Um, I don't, I don't insist on it with extractions. Um, because frankly, when I take them out, they're almost always black. Um, and the patient feels better when it's removed. I got uh, another question here about your philosophy. Of course, when I was in school, you know, you were taught uh, ice pack. Patient goes out the door with an ice pack. In the naturopathic world, by providing an ice pack, you're stopping the flow of blood to that area and reducing the body's own innate knowing how to take care of itself. So I'm interested in your philosophy. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, I'm glad you brought that up. So um, again, we, we try to cover all the bases. We'll send them home with one of those cutesy little ice packs that you can refreeze. But we explain to them, we kind of put it on one hand, you've got your ibuprofen and your ice pack and those traditional modalities you could use for pain management if your goal is you want to try to minimize pain as much as possible. However, we explain to them by stimulating blood flow, you will accelerate the healing process which is why we do the low level laser therapy, which brings more blood into the area. Uh, and we provide them with that light for two to three weeks. Usually at that point, you know, all the cellular connections that need to occur will. Um, and most of our patients don't use the ice pack or the ibuprofen, but it's there if they want it, you know, and it's always good to have an ice pack around the house anyway, so they can just have it. Right. But uh, again, it's kind of a nicety that we offer. But generally, we, you know, when we explain to them the pros and cons, they choose to go, you know, the route of best healing, which probably isn't surprising. I mean, that's the group of people to whom we're marketing. Uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dentists in the Portland metropolitan, er metropolitan area, and we are by far not the cheapest. So there's a lot of other places they can go if, if that's their goal is to keep costs down. Um, our goal is to help them understand and, 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 and really understand their options and how to attain their goals, um, which we find out because we ask them, you know, it's all about communication and connection with, with that person. And every person is different as we know. That was a great question. Kelly, um, I really appreciate Wait, you coming back on and gracing us. Is there anybody else that has any other questions before we close for this evening? You, Teresa, mm -hmm. I see your hand waving. So, mm -hmm. yes. Um, I actually want to know, do you find sometimes that some people don't make good quality LPRF? Because sometimes we have pulled eight tubes of blood and we That's don't get true. nothing. It's Absolutely. like, you're looking at them going, do you have any clotting factors? Yeah, you know? isn't that isn't that interesting? Yes, I mean, I've, I've certainly found that. Um, and I'll tell you two, two different instances. Um, what do you do in those cases when you do see that? Yeah, thank you. Oh my gosh, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we've done a lot of trial and error and, you know, trying to, you know, use this up here to think about what, what could have affected why that worked. So I'll, I'll share with you this. Um, going back to when we first started using LPRF, if we were doing an IV sedation case, um, sometimes we would try to use uh, a, a catheter for the, um, the solution that the anesthesiologist was using and use that line to draw the blood from as well. And I don't know what it was about that scenario exactly that made it, it just seemed like we never got great LPRF. Um, and I also think that in the cases where my hygienist, particularly Kristen, who's been doing it the longest, you know, when it was new for all of us, I suspect, and I can't, I can't prove this, but I suspect that 
there were a lot of times where the amount of time that elapsed from when we drew it out of their arm, uh, combined with if they're if they're like a hypercoagulator, um, if that were the case, sometimes we just wouldn't get good LPRF. But I will say, even if we're even if we're doing an IV sedation case for the patient now, and we want LPRF, the hygienist will bring them back first to their room. They do the blood draw there and get it spinning. And then they'll bring them over to the room where we're going to do the sedation case. So they kind of become two different things. Um, I, I, I really want to take advantage of the fact that most people, and for good reason, you know, their nerves are up, their blood pressure is up. Uh, if the blood pressure is up, we're going to drive a better flow for our blood draw uh, and get it from the arm into the centrifuge as fast as possible. Um, that was one of the things that, um, Dr. Mazor from Israel, who I trained with, one of the things he really impressed on us was the importance of getting it from the arm into the centrifuge as quickly as possible. Um, and I have to say, nowadays, it's pretty rare that, that our LPRF isn't very good, but it still happens sometimes. And it, well, I, it's it not does, often, but it does happen. And I'm, I'm wondering what you do in those cases where you're like, where you're looking at it going, there's nothing there. Yeah. So, I usually will, if it's, if it's horrible, like let's say there's nothing there, I'll talk to the patient about usually one of two options, maybe three. I mean, I generally say to patients, there's infinite options, but there's probably two or three I would, you know, consider. Uh, one is, and this is what I used to do before I had LPRF on board. Um, one of the multitude of lasers that I own is a Periolase MVP7. And sometimes I will pull that out and put it on the, the coagulation setting and just clot the blood that's coming out of there and set it. And that, that can work beautifully. Um, we may also talk about, you know, using uh, uh, like a collagen uh, substitute, uh, like a bovine type of a collagen, something like that. Um, years ago, I used to use some bone grafting material that was actually pretty effective. Uh, I'm totally blanking on the name now. Um, Osteograph. If, uh, oh my gosh, I'm bl I'm totally blanking on it. I, I can't even think of the name of the. It's been a, it's been a long time, <laughs> you know, since I used it. Um, uh, I can tell you, don't use guy door. That stuff was horrible. Um, but we we'll use those. I will share, uh, if we're, if we're going to graft a large area, and let's say I want to do a sinus lift or something of that, uh, you know, along with it, um, I love pulling off a tube or two of fibrinogen, you know, like where you do the shorter spin cycle for three minutes and pull that off and chop up the LPRF and mix it with some bone grafting material. And, you know, if I need more, uh, just more body to it, so that when I put it in um, the osteotomy site or sinus lift site, that it has more substance to it, that seems to work really well too, because it kind of gels it, right? I call it, it's sticky bone and it works beautifully. So good, I love that. Yeah, that's, that's what good. I do. Yeah. But yeah, some I, of those are mystery, right? The, the LPRF, I think, sometimes people are just sick, you know? Right. I mean, you, you know, you're not looking at platelet counts. You're not looking at clotting factors and you're going to have those odd ones that come in. I know we try to stick to the rule of draw it and spin it within two minutes. I mean, yeah. meaning from the time you make the puncture to the yeah. time you're spinning down. Yeah. Yeah. We I try to that, do the same thing, but when you're drawing eight tubes of blood, sometimes it takes longer than two minutes. Right. Yeah. So we'll start it before, you know, you might start four yeah. and, then come back and start the other four. I, I wanted to say that, uh, first off, tomorrow, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. Absolutely. Tomorrow night, Blanche is going to be on speaking about everything to do with IV vitamin C. So you guys, oh. please, you know, pay attention to Blanche's meeting. If you can't participate, then uh, they're all recorded. So you can, just like this one tonight, it's going to be recorded and you'll be able to listen to it at your convenience. Next Monday night, 
I have a doctor coming on specifically talking about vitamin D and PRF. Oh, great. So maybe, maybe we'll learn some pearls there uh, with that as well. But if there's nobody that has any further questions, we're going to go ahead and call it for this evening. And Kelly so is amazing, much, Kelly. amazing presentation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was great. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you so much.